And good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. Mm -hmm. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on a recent book by Julian Jackson entitled France on Trial, the Case of Marshall Pétain, published in late August by Harvard University Press. Our discussants this afternoon are Shannon Fogg of Missouri University of Science and Technology and Alice Kaplan of Yale University. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University. I co-chair the seminar with Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Christian's traveling and won't be joining us this afternoon. For those who don't know, the seminar is a collaborative and nonpartisan venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association that's been exploring new historical scholarship since 2010. A few quick things before we get going. First, let me invite you back to next week's session uh, on November 20th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time Ooh. for a session on a new book by Catherine Brownell entitled 24-7 Politics, Cable Television and the Fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News. This will be a AHA-sponsored session, and you'll need to register through the AHA's website. Information will momentarily be posted in the chat on the Zoom. Second, we'd like to recognize two people who work very hard behind the scenes to make the seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the AHA. Third, on the logistics front, today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And finally, when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function or the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll call on as many folks as we can. And with those preliminaries out of the way, let's get the seminar fully going. Our distinguished author this afternoon is Julian Jackson, Emeritus Professor of French History at Queen Mary University of London. His publications include France, The Dark Years, 1940 to 1944, published in 2001, The Fall of France, published in 2003, a book that won the Wolfson Prize for History, and A Certain Idea of France, A Life of Charles de Gaulle, 2018, which won several prizes, including the Duff Cooper Prize for Nonfiction, and it was a book of the year for The New Yorker, The Financial Times, The Spectator, and other publications. Today, he will be speaking on his latest work, France on Trial, The Case of Marshall Pétain, published by Harvard University Press several months ago in August. Julian, welcome to the seminar. The screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's um, actually my first chance to present the book to a, a properly academic audience, so I'm very pleased to be able to do that. And I'm very um, pleased also, or honored actually, to have two uh, such distinguished speakers, both of who are both of whom are real experts in parts of what I've talked about. And Alice, of course, wrote a classic book on the trial, one a different trial, um, which took place before my trial of Robert Brasillac, which was certainly an inspiration to me. And Shannon Fogg has written very um, perceptively about the occupation in all kinds of ways. So it's wonderful. This for me is a wonderful chance. Um, I was told to speak for about 20 minutes, just kind of presenting the main points of the book, arguments. And now it's, a, it's a tricky exercise because you know, some people I know will have read the book. Well, obviously, Alice and Shannon will have read the book, but um, I imagine some people in the audience will have done, many won't have done. Um, so I, I kind of need to, to for those, and if, if, you know, this is boring for those who have, I still feel it's necessary. So what was, uh, what I'm going to do is really three parts. I'm just going to first give you the, what I was trying to do in this book, something very quick about sources, and then thirdly, sort of three of the key arguments, three, not just the aims, but the actual arguments I was trying to put. So first, let's begin with uh, just what the book is. So basically, it is a kind of, you might say, microscopic study of the three weeks of the trial of Marshal Pétain, who was put on, uh, obviously, I'm sure everybody here knows who was the leader of the Vichy government during the four years of the occupation. Uh, he was put on trial. Uh, there was a special high court convened uh, by the new government of General de Gaulle, and Pétain was put on trial uh, at the end of July 1945, and he was the trial lasted three weeks. Um, it's a trial that de Gaulle himself would have preferred not to happen, and Pétain himself had kind of been kidnapped by the Germans 
after the liberation. So when France was liberated, Pétain was actually in Germany. And de Gaulle's great hope was that he would um, sort of take refuge in, Swit in Switzerland, which was a possibility, and not come back to France. Because de Gaulle was well aware that Pétain was a very divisive figure. He was hated by many, but also adored by others. So he'd have preferred a trial in absentia. But unfortunately for him, Pétain presented himself at the French frontier, uh, the Swiss the Franco-Swiss frontier on the 21st of, August, of April 1945, saying, I want to come back and be judged by the French people. So there had to be a trial. Um, it's my, my, my reason for, I think it's a, a fascinating moment there. It's obviously by far, um, uh, it's comparable, I think, to other such occasions in the post-war period. It's comparable, obviously, in some sense, to the Nuremberg trials, it's that's to say the great, you know, the leaders of Nazi Germany who were put on trial, the Tokyo trials. Uh, but I think the difference between those and the Pétain trial is the Pétain trial is the trial of Pétain by the French. It's not an international tribunal, as you get at Nuremberg. It is the French creating a court to try their leader and previously uh, revered war hero. So that's why I called the book France on Trial, because it seems to me that it's the French trying Pétain and in some sense trying themselves as they try Pétain. Another comparison uh, that might be with the trial of the collaborationist leader uh, Quisling in, in Norway, um, who was put on trial by a Norwegian court after the war for collaboration. But it doesn't, again, seem to me uh, completely comparable because Quisling was just a fanatic. I mean, he was a he, he, he was a fascist with the tiniest amount of real support. He wasn't a national hero like Pétain. So Pétain's trial is the French trying themselves through this v absolutely both adored but hated a figure that you couldn't avoid having in some sense to grapple with. And to me, it's the beginning of a 50-year conversation. The trial, um, I end my first chapter by saying that uh, the, the great Catholic novelist François Mauriac said at the end of the trial, once Peter had been found guilty, I'm not giving away too many secrets, I hope. It's not a spoiler to say that he was found guilty. Um, and he uh, he was... He was um, uh, but Moriac said, you know, the trial is over, but a trial like this is never over. This trial will go on forever as the Dreyfus affair. And so, and I think that is the case. I think that it's, uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, some, nobody has actually ever really written properly on the trial. There have been books that have, have, have looked at it. And none of them, I think, there've been books by defenders of Pétain who say that he was treated unfairly, etc. The best, one of the first books that ever um, studied the épuration, that's to say the purges in France after the war, was by the American historian Peter Novick. It still, in my view, remains one of the best books written on that, although there's been a huge amount of other stuff. And I remember, and, and Novick said about the Pétain trial that it was an elaborate ceremony aimed at symbolically condemning a policy. An elaborate ceremony aimed at symbolically condemning a policy. What did he mean by that? Essentially, what he meant by that, it was a show trial. It wasn't serious. It was symbolic. It didn't really, it, it, it had to happen, but what was said wasn't really very important. It was purely symbolic. My starting point is that it's more than that, that it is a real trial. There are something like 70 witnesses for the defense and for the prosecution. There are three defense lawyers. The defense lawyers have access to all the documents. There's a, um, there is a, there is, uh, there are debates, there are arguments in court. And in some sense, what I think you see in that court is for the first time, the French having a chance to revisit, to learn about those four years that have just happened, but are already history in some kind of way. And so I want to take seriously what's said at the trial. I don't just want to see it as a so tri show trial. I want to see it as, a, as something where the arguments can be taken seriously. My book is also, I think, an exercise. So that's the overall aim. It's also, I think, uh, I won't go into this, but I, I wanted it, I saw it partly as an exercise in historical narrative. I wanted to tell a story. I wanted to tell a gripping story, and I tried to 
reconstitute the atmosphere of this stiflingly hot, cramped courtroom in a hot Paris summer. The rivalries between the defense lawyers, the old man, 89-year-old hero, sitting on a little armchair with all this swirling around him and people not sure whether he's completely understanding. Sometimes he falls asleep. Sometimes he wakes up. He's made, he said at the beginning, he's not going to speak, but sometimes he does speak. So there's this tragedy. There's a kind of uh, antique tragedy, classical tragedy uh, about the whole thing. There's the sudden drama of the unexpected arrival of the evil villain, as people wanted to see it, of the, of the Vichy regime, Pierre Laval. And for two weeks, everybody had been saying, oh, it's all due to Pierre Laval. Pierre Laval's the, the, the real villain. That was the argument of the defense. And then suddenly, Pierre Laval, who'd taken refuge in Spain, comes back, is, is basically extradited back to France. And so he is in court. And this is an extraordinarily dramatic moment. So for me, uh, the drama was part of what I wanted to do. I wanted to see it as an exercise in historical narrative. So that was, broadly speaking, the, 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 the plan at the beginning. Very quickly, just on the sources, if you're interested, it wasn't too complicated. The trial, the entire debates of the trial over three, work, three weeks are published and available in the Journal Officiel, which is the French sort of journal of record and so on. So one can read the debates. The, what, the, what the French call the instruction the preparation of the trial, the interviewing of all the witnesses, the collation of documents is all available in the Archive Nationale if you one, one wants to read it. Um, there are the, Brit the British and the Americans were very interested in what was going on. So there's stuff in the British archives. There's not very much actually in the American archives. We could come back to America if people are interested. And I did find one really interesting source. Uh, one of the, those who know Alice Kaplan's book about Brezillac will remember that one of the most fascinating things about her book was her attempt to reconstitute the lives or the, the hinterland, if you want, of the jurors at the trial. Now, I know who my 24, in the Petain trial, there are 24 jurors. They are set 12 resistance jurors and 12 parliamentarians uh, from the pre-war parliament. And we know who they are. Unfortunately, we don't know very much about what they're thinking during the trial, very little. But I had the good luck to uh, come upon a, an unpublished um, a journal of one of the resistance jur jurors, a man called Jacques Le, um, Le Comte Boinet, who was a really very important resistor in the northern zone. And his um, memoirs have just been published, but the, that that bit hasn't been published on the trial. And he was one of the jurors. And what I found fascinating about him is that he was a a, a conservative resistor. Uh, he was not. He he he'd been against Pétain from the very beginning, but he didn't particularly like the new left wing politics politics of the resistance. So he's there, actually wanting to know the truth. And what's fascinating about his journal is we follow his doubts. Uh, and, you know, was I right? Oh, is there something to be said for Petain? Should we believe today's witness? And so this is a man who's taking seriously and conscientiously his um, duty as a juror. So what are the, the basic sort of arguments of the book? Arguments, so that I've given the aims, what are, my, what are the big points I'm trying to make? Um, well, I realize I'm already far into my allocated time, so I'm going to be very fast on this, but we can return to it. The first was really an exploration of a simple question. What was Pétain's crime? What was he guilty of? And through that, I wanted to open the possibility of, of discussing those four difficult years of French history through the prism of Pétain. And if we just take, I began by taking four pe three people who had all been hostile to Vichy from the very beginning, one General de Gaulle. The second, the philosopher Simon, or the second, of, um, the intellectual um, uh, Raymond Aron, and the third, the philosopher Simon Weil. Each of them had been hostile to Vichy, but each of them thought Pétain's crime was different from the other. For de Gaulle, Pétain's crime was quite simple. He'd signed an armistice with Germany. France hadn't been, France could fight on. The, the armistice and nothing but the armistice was the crime. Raymond Aron, who was uh, a left-wing some centre-left intellectual who was in London during the war, uh, had uh, wrote you know, really tough argue, uh, articles against Pétain. But in 1945, he said, in my view, the armistice was justifiable. 
we had been beaten. Somebody had to sort of sign some kind of contract with the Germans, as it were, and to, to protect the interests of the French in an occupied country. For Aron, the armistice was justifiable. The moment when Pétain is a criminal, if you want, is the moment in November 1942, when the Germans invade the whole of France, take over the whole of France, and they've landed in North Africa. And at that point, Aron says, at that point, Pétain has served no purpose, and he should have gone to North Africa. And Simon Weil, from New York and then from London, says, uh, Yes, I was against the armistice. The armistice was wrong, but it wasn't Pétain's crime. It was the French crime. Everybody was complicit in the armistice. Uh, so there are three different ways of looking at. It. Now you could that you could say that the, the crime, and 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 you could also. What's also interesting is that the the defence um, uh, lawyers were themselves divided as to what the best way to defend Pétain was. The most, the senior lawyer, a man called Payon, basically wanted to say, oh, well, Pétain was a bit led astray by his evil advisors. He was doing his best. He was an old man. He was beyond his, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the young, dynamic, um, in some ways, hero of the trial, who's also a, a sort of anti-hero of, of, of Alice Kaplan's book, uh, Jacques Isorny, wanted to say, no, I'm not going to explain away Vichy. I am going to defend everything that Pétain did. So there, there's a, 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 a split between uh, the defence lawyers. There's also doubt among the prosecution as to what Pétain has to be tried for. There was a very interesting conversation just before the uh, trial took place between the Minister of Justice, a man called Tai Chen, and um, uh, the American and British ambassadors, where he said what they're going to concentrate on in the trial is the period after November 42, when Pétain could have left France but didn't. But actually, that's not what the prosecutor did. And the prosecutor wasted at least a week of the trial pursuing an absurd claim, I think it probably was absurd, that Pétain had been plotting the defeat of France and the fall of the Republic all through the 1930s. So there's a whole range of debates about what Pétain's um, crime is. That leads me to um, try a, a sort of counter, set of counterfactual arguments at the end of the book. Because in a sense, the defence, one of the defences of the defence, sorry, of his defence lawyers, was that however bad things were under Vichy, they would have been worse if there hadn't been a Vichy. And that is a that leads one to try and pose a counterfactual argument. Okay, let's take them at their word. Well, what if there hadn't been a Vichy? What would have happened then? And I try to play with that idea that the French government had gone to North Africa, had not signed an armistice, and France had been totally occupied. We can come back to that, the nature of that counterfactual if you want. Second big argument, I suppose, of the book, or there are lots of arguments. I'm trying to pull out the ones I think are most interesting. Um, is the, the place of the Jews in the trial. That's what I think a lot of people are surprised by, is how little the trial was about anti-Semitism. Not one Holocaust survivor or um, relative of Holocaust survivor was called upon to testify. Indeed, not one Jew testified at the trial. The only Jew was the socialist leader, uh, Leon Blum, who wasn't there as a Jew, but who was there as a socialist. Uh, the only time that the Jewish issue was explicitly raised, it comes up from time to time, was explicitly raised, was by two witnesses who, astonishingly enough, were called not by the prosecution, but by the defence. The defence thought they had a good defence on the Jewish issue. Their line was that Pétain defended French Jews against the Germans, and that what happened to the Jews was a German policy, not a French policy. I could say a lot more about that, but again, I'm seeing time is going, we can come back to it. I think Shannon will have things to say about that, but I would just say that those arguments probably, uh, oh, sorry, I will say two other things. The, what you might call the Jewish organizations of the period, uh, who had formed themselves into an organization which still exists in France today, called the CRIF, the C-R-I-F, were very nervous about the trial, because in France, in May 1945, there was a lot of ambient anti-Semitism stoked by uh, the French owner, uh, the, those French people who had taken over or bought in good 
faith, possibly, uh, properties that had belonged to Jews who had lost, who'd, who'd been uh, uh, expelled. And those who survived came back and wanted to take back their properties. And so the Kreef was really very worried about uh, sort of, uh, should we ask to testify the Petan trial? Perhaps it isn't a good moment. Perhaps we should keep our heads down, etc. And finally, of the 24 jurors, I said we don't know much about what was going on on their heads, but we do know from what we have heard from one or two jurors who spoke afterwards, that the one of the Jewish jurors, the oldest juror of the whole, in the, in the, in the whole jury, a man called Georges Lévy Alfonderi, who was a, um, an Alsatian Jewish man of about 80, he'd been an old Third Republic politician. He said, when the jury were deliberating, he said, as an Alsatian, as an Alsatian, I would vote for the death of Petain because of what he gave up Alsace-Lorraine to the Germans. But as a Jew, I would vote to save his head because I think he worked to save Jews. That's the way, that my point is, that is the way it was perceived at the time. Finally, then, thirdly, uh, the whole third part of the book looks really at the debate since 1945. The basically the, the continuing conversation. And I take the continuing conversation uh, through efforts to have by Pétain's defense lawyer, Jacques Isorny, to have his body transferred from, uh, sorry, I should just, now, second spoiler alert, Pétain was sentenced to death. It was commuted to life imprisonment and he died in his in the on the little island in which he had been um, imprisoned, the Ile Dieu, uh, um, on, in 1951. After his death, pro petanist said he's a national hero. He should be transferred to lie with the veterans of the, Ver of the Verdun conflict in the First World War. And so that becomes a big theme for the extreme right. And so I try to follow that theme, that debate through right through to the present. And I'm going to uh, eliminate a lot more of what I could have said because of time. I want to hear what the others have to say. But uh, I'll just end with the end of the book. Uh, which a lot of people have criticized me for. A lot of re reviewers always have to find something to criticize. So a lot of them said, oh, we love this book, but we think this last sentence is bad. And the last sentence of the book was, uh, the Petain case is now over. And what I meant to say by that was this, uh, that I don't, ever since Jacques Chirac made his famous speech in 1995, accepting the responsibility of the French, of France, in the deportation and deaths of Jews in the occupation. That issue, I think, is that issue is now essentially closed. It is accepted that France, in some kind of way, was complicit. Now, this was very controversial at the time, because for the government of General de Gaulle after the war, Vichy did not exist. Vichy was not France. France was in London with de Gaulle. And the operation in Vichy was a so-called government of, of Pétain. After Chirac, that becomes more difficult to say, even if between 1995 and the present, there are two ideas still floating around. One that Vichy was, because on the French statute book, there is still the ordinance of the 9th of August, 1944, which says that Vichy did not exist in so many words. And But we also have Chirac saying that France committed a crime. So we have two discourses which don't completely mesh. And the question, where is France, remains a big issue. But my point is that I don't really think there's any mileage today in, uh, I think that the culpability, if you want, of Pétain's regime in what happened to the Jews is pretty much settled. Now, in, 19, in 2022, and I end the book just, I, I managed to get this into the book. In 2022, at the, tri at the last presidential election, uh, Mac the, the extreme right candidate, uh, an extreme right candidate, even more extreme than the Marine Le Pen, called Eric Zemmour, tried to uh, put a series of arguments that um, Pétain resuscitated an old argument that was present in the trial in 45, that Pétain had um, uh, saved French Jews at the cost of sacrificing non-French Jews, foreign Jews. Well, in the end, Zemmour scored 
I, not nothing, but he scored six percent, roughly six percent in the presidential election. Whereas Marine Le Pen, uh, who is the other extreme right leader, who has studiously distanced herself from Pétain and from her own father, Jean Marie Le Pen was a Pétainist, became got through to the second round. So my when I say the Pétain case is now closed, my point was that. There's no mileage in PETA, if you see what I mean, for the extreme right. That is not to say that PETANism in new forms is not, is closed. And so the last line of the French translation, which I'm just finishing, is something like, uh, the PETA case is now closed, but PETANism, PETANism is alive and well in France. My point being that it's not through PETA, it's not, it, it, that it's through, as it were, um, uh, distancing cell itself from Petain, that the extreme right is uh, able to, um, it needs to distance itself from Petain to be able to push through its ideology of discrimination and exclusion and authoritarianism, which seems to me absolutely in the tradition of Petainism. I should say that yesterday, there was a historic event in Paris, which I'm still going to, might try and get into the uh, French translation, because I think I can change the last lines. A historic moment, really is a historic moment. There was a big demonstration against um, anti-Semitism in Paris. And astonishingly enough, uh, in that demonstration, we found were to be found the extreme right of Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour, and not the left of Jean-Pierre uh, Chevènement, the um, um, La France Insoumise. Now, my own view is that a party whose deputy leader only two weeks earlier actually said, a man called Bardella, actually said, I don't believe that Jean, I don't believe, je ne crois pas que Jean-Marie Le Pen était antisémite. I don't believe that Jean-Marie Le Pen, the father, was antisemitic. Was at, and a man who's six times been convicted for antisemitic comments was present at this at this march so for me the distancing is is superficial and actually grotesque i would even say um since you know um uh, no holds barred here but it's uh it still seems to me that there is no real debate about the Petain trial any longer. I think I think the Petain trial is settled, and the way in which the extreme right is now positioning itself in France is by distancing, distancing itself from Petain. Sorry, I got a bit rushed at the end, and I missed out many things, but I hope that gives a sense of what the book is trying to do. Thank you. Julian, thank you very much. Our first discussant this afternoon is Shannon Fogg, Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History and Political Science at Missouri University of Science and Technology. She earned her PhD from the University of Iowa and is the author of The Politics of Everyday Life in Vichy, France, Foreigners, Undesirables, and Strangers, published by Cambridge University Press in 2009, and Stealing Home, Looting, Restitution, and Reconstituting Jewish Lives in France, 1942, 1947, published by Oxford University Press in 2017. Shannon, welcome to the seminar. Thank you very much, Eric, for your introduction and for uh, inviting me to discuss Julian's book. I want to thank very much the Washington Hist History Seminar for this opportunity. Uh, Julian is a prolific scholar and is the person I turn to when I'm looking for details on, on the Vichy uh, years. So I look forward to sharing ideas and, and hearing more. So with France on trial, Julian Jackson has given us a story of political intrigue, courtroom drama, and myth-making. And Julian, you said you wanted to tell this engaging story, and, and you succeed in this. It is very dramatic. Uh, but perhaps more than anything, the book provides insights into how history, with a capital H, is made. The debates the choices, the interpretations, the justifications, shifting priorities and people that shape the way the past is remembered, it is retold, and also how it is used by people over a long period of time. Uh, the book is a story of specific actors within the broader sweep of historical events and asks about the responsibility of individuals versus the responsibility of institutions. France on Trial is both a detailed daily account of the three-week trial of Marshal Pétain 
and an accessible history of the late 20th and early 21st century in France. So I think it does double duty in that way. It addresses specific legal questions as well as the broader moral and philo philosophical questions about patriotism, legitimacy and legality, treason and sacrifice. It's an examination of the past, but it also addresses themes that continue to resonate in, in our current time. And I think Julian uh, just explained that very well. So Professor Jackson begins his book with Pétain's meeting with Hitler at Montoir, which seems a very appropriate start as Pétain has become synonymous with collaboration. The establishment of the regime and the policies of the National Revolution form part of the narrative of most studies of the war years. And France on Trial does touch on Vichy's policies throughout, but the main focus is on the lesser examined waning days of the French state, Pétain's trial, and the many decades of afterlives that followed. And I have to say, um, even as someone who works on the, that post-war period, I learned a lot of things that I, I just never realized about the end of, of that time period and what happens um, kind of politically around this. And Pétain's post-war fate is often overshadowed in many histories that chronicle the war's end by things like the Allied landings, the liberation, and the arrival of Charles de Gaulle back in Paris. Jackson clearly demonstrates throughout the book how the stories of Pétain and de Gaulle are intertwined, but rather than examining the post-war myth of resistance, as many other studies have, Julian unpacks the cult of Pétain over an extended period. It's about the end of the war, but it also demonstrates how the war and Pétain have continued to loom large in French politics, in culture, and in society. Throughout the book, Professor Jackson focuses on the relationship between Pétain, the trial, and the making of history. The various actors in the book recognize their role in participating in and shaping history as it was happening. Jackson notes that the trial served as a kind of history lesson for the public, illuminating the recent past and revealing the events that led to the collapse of the Third Republic, a story that was not known to many people at the time. One juror that you mentioned in your, in your introduction um, also saw the educational value of the trial while simultaneously noting its political nature and its likely predetermined outcome. It was a spectacle, it was a judgment and a justification of the past, and it was also an attempt to shape the historical narrative moving forward. Pétain himself referenced history in the single planned declaration he made before the court. He noted that he had been begged to serve France on the most tragic day of her history and believed that future studies would vindicate his actions, stating history will reveal all that I spared you while my adversaries only think of blaming me for what was unavoidable. Jackson talks about Pétain's defense team as arguing for the underdogs, but they are also attempting to write history as the losers on the losing side and shape the history going forward. This theme of historical interpretation is strong throughout the book, as is Professor Jackson's attention to historical context and historiography. Pétain's trial did not happen in isolation, and Jackson draws in various threads without losing sight of the main narrative. Parallel, though, I think, to this focus on history in, in the book is, is the role of myths as well. Uh, Marshall Pétain's status as the hero of Verdun created its own myth, and Professor Jackson talks about the magic of his legend that shaped public opinion and contributed to his enduring popularity. Professor Jackson also clearly traces both the origins and persistence of myths, such as Pétain's double game in the way that this could then be used in his defense, or the idea of Pétain as a shield and de Gaulle as a sword, or the argument that the men, those two men were both strings in France's bow. Additionally, there are myths related to Vichy's participation in the Holocaust that were perpetuated by the trial as well. The afterlives of these myths, I think, demonstrate the, the success, if we want to call it success, of the arguments that are made in court, as well as the depth of the divisions in France. Professor Jackson has drawn on a wide range of sources, including media coverage of the trial, the trial proceedings, court documents, journals and memoirs, and personal papers. But despite the large body of evidence he was able to draw on, in some ways, France on trial is also the history of absence 
and historical silences. So he's telling the story of what's been left out as well. One of the greatest silences from the trial came from Peyton himself. The marshal made a single declaration, a planned declaration, he sometimes spoke up, um, after the reading of the indictment, in which he made it clear that he would not answer questions nor make additional statements. As a result, the trial is shaped by the witnesses who were also trying to explain their roles in history and the lawyers who had their own goals and agendas in making a place in history for themselves. There were also silences around certain wartime experiences with no Jews being called as witnesses and only two resistors briefly testifying as deportees. Professor Jackson also notes the absence of women's participation in the trial and describes the courtroom as a, quote, very masculine space where all the jurors, the lawyers, and 66 out of the 67 witnesses were men. With this longer historical approach, Professor Jackson includes a chapter on the absent Jews during the trial, as well as a chapter on remembering the Jews in the afterlife section. He notes that Vichy's role in the deportation of 75,000 Jews attracted less attention during the trial than a telegram that Peyton might or might not have sent to Hitler. So there's more focus on that one, uh, one incident than, than, um, than the fate of the Jews. However, Jewish experiences were used by the defense as part of the argument that Peyton served as a shield. This is an interpretation that most scholars, including Jackson, reject, but that continues to persist in politics and occasionally in some scholarship as well. And in a somewhat unique chapter, Professor Jackson addresses the counterfactual arguments, the what ifs that had been raised that would support Peyton's defense, including the idea of a Vichy shield. He suggests and more than suggests outright states like Robert Paxton and Michael Maris in the revised version of Vichy France and the Jews, that the question should not be why so many Jews survived in France. And that number we estimate to be around 75% of the Jews, but rather why so few Jews survived given the conditions in, in, in the country and the, the things that could have uh, helped. I'm gonna wrap up my comments here, but just pose a, a few questions or, or topics um, for discussion. And this is something, Julian, that you talked uh, about as you were discussing, and it's this idea of slippages. And we often use Pétain and Vichy and France interchangeably. And does, does studying the trial clarify or muddy these distinctions? You talked about why you called it France on trial. Um, and you talked about there was no um, Right. Who's you? You when you talked about Chirac, you talked about France's responsibility. So, do you see clear lines between these de designations of Pétain and France and Vichy? Um, are there differences between individuals, institutions, and other structures? So, kind of thinking about these ideas of France on trial or Vichy on trial, Pétain on trial. Um, also. Um, I'm interested in some of the differences between legal evidence and interpretation and historical evidence and interpretation and political uses of law in, in history. And you talk about these things um, as well. You talk about the prosecutor arguing that the trial was less to recall the horrors that we all know than to explain how they had occurred. So what, not what happened, but rather how it happened and kind of thinking about the differences between those legal distinctions and how we use those ideas as, as historians. Um, so trials today remain a vehicle for trying to interpret and understand the recent past. So what did um, studying a trial in history teach you or what can it teach us as we're looking kind of forward as well? And I think I will, I will stop at that and let other people ask questions as well. Thank you, Shannon. Julian, care to reflect or respond to those comments? If you unmute. Sorry, I've unmuted, yeah. Oh, you want to do this now rather than, uh, okay. Sure. The, the, well, um, I, uh, the, just uh, the point that Shannon, that Shannon made about uh, Dieppe, uh, 
the Dieppe moment and the Jews. I, I I just expand on that a bit because I think it does encapsulate something about the difference of uh, the. Uh, what I think I wanted partly to show is that we must try and think about Pétain as they thought about Pétain in 1945 and not as we think about Pétain today. Now, in August 1942, about 15,000 Jews were rounded up in the free zone, in the unoccupied zone of France, with the French by the French police, uh, with uh, uh, sort of because there'd been an agreement between the, the French government and the Germans. Uh, these were foreign Jews. That same month, that event is hardly mentioned in the trial. That same month, on the 21st of August, uh, Pétain sent probably, though a lot of the trial was sent, sent, tried to work out whether it had really been sent or not, a telegram to Hitler, um, or to the German government, saying that uh, the, after there had been a failed um, allied, um, um, an American-Canadian raid at, at Dieppe in August 1942, which had been repulsed by the Germans, uh, uh, Hitler congratulated the population of Dieppe for, you know, uh, not 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 uh, supporting the not supporting the invaders or whatever, and uh, Pétain sent a telegram to Hitler saying we might consider working with the Germans with you for the defense of national territory. Right. So he sends a telegram to Hitler saying we might be ready to consider working with the Germans to defend our territory against an Anglo-Saxon or an American-British invasion. Now, we don't know whether a telegram was sent or not, but more time was spent in the court discussing that telegram, whether it had been sent, who sent it, who drafted it, whether it had been received, than the question of the Jews. Now, why? That seems very odd to us. Well, it's partly, and this goes back to what Shannon was saying, another thing she raised, about legal questions. What is Pétain being tried for? What is the actual clause of the penal code which he is being tried under? Well, he's tried under, essentially, under clause 75 of the French penal code, which is called intelligence avec l'ennemi, uh, in complicity with the enemy. Spying would be what it would be normally, but collaboration. Now, if that letter, that letter, that telegram, if it was genuine, was a, a sign of collaboration, ready to work with the Germans, militarily even, whereas the arrest of the Jews in the South was seen by most people as an operation, essentially a German operation, which the French police, people didn't talk about the French police, were forced to be involved with. In other words, the way the trial was structured around intelligence with the enemy meant that what you might call domestically generated anti-Semitism was was not was 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 more difficult, as it were, to include under in in the, in the very terms, the legal terms in which the trial was conducted. Just one other thing, also um, about slippages. Well, yes, there are. Um, there was an enormous amount of trial was about uh, to what extent Pétain was himself responsible. And there was the whole issue with Laval. And so it came up after. And so people tried to blame Laval. They, they claimed that Pétain had been led astray by his advisors and so on. But in the end, I think one of the big issues of the trial was it was almost it was metaphysical as much as legal and political. And there was a wonderful editorial by the. Um, uh, uh, journalist um, uh, Maurice C C Clavel, uh, who um, wrote, what is at stake in this trial is the soul of France. It's a metaphysical question. And the question is not whether or not Peta might or might not have protected people and whether or not without Peta more people might have perished or not. There's also the question of honour. And honor and survival were two polarities. And for de Gaulle, the key word was honor. An enormous amount of the trial was about the meaning of honor. Where is honor? Uh, and, and what is the honorable course of action? And this becomes, uh, as I say, sometimes almost in the debates, philosophical and semi almost metaphysical. There are lots more things I, I, I could say, but I'd rather hear, um, you know, hear the next um speaker alice and we can we can come back to um to any of the points and any points have been raised i see there's one question i saw raised in the chat which i'm very happy to answer but i 
like to come back to that after hearing Alice. Thank you. And we will indeed come back to that. But since you've raised the issue of a question in the chat, let me remind the audience uh, that you too can get in the queue to pose a question, uh, either by using the raise hand function, in which case we call on you, you unmute yourself, and then you pose the question directly, or the Q&A function in Zoom, in which case you post the question and I get to read it. Uh, we prefer that you, if you can, use the raise hand function, uh, but either will do. Our second discussed this afternoon is Alice Kaplan, Sterling Professor of French at Yale University and a specialist on 20th century France. Her teaching and research have focused on the Second World War, the Liberation, the Algerian War, and a variety of French writers. Amongst her many books are The Collaborator, The Trial and Execution of Robert Brassillac, The Interpreter, published in 2005, and Dreaming in French, The Paris Years of Jacqueline Bouvet Kennedy, Susan Sontag, and Angela Davis, 2012. Her recent publications include Maison Atlas, a novel, and with Laura Maris, States of Plague, Reading Albert Camus in a Pandemic, published in 2022. She's also the author of Camus, Travels in the Americas, published this year. Her book, Looking for the Stranger, Albert Camus and the Life of a Literary Classic, published in 2016, was the subject of a Washington History Seminar at the Wilson Center back when we actually gathered face-to-face -face in person. Alice, welcome back to the seminar, this time online. Eric, thank you so much. It's great to be back, and it's it's a kind of thrill to to be in conversation with Julian and with Shannon about this wonderful book. Let me let me just get started. Um, I think there couldn't be a more opportune time to be talking about state complicity in war crimes, about collaboration disguised as support, and about revisionism in the memory of a con of a controversial figure. But since I'm the literary person in the room and the author of a book about one of the trials that preceded Pétain's, the treason trial of the writer and journalist Robert Braziak in January 1945, I'd like to say a word first about Julian Jackson's narrative art and about the challenges and opportunities in writing a book about Pétain's trial, uh, challenges that he meets at every turn. Julian Jackson is the historian of France in World War II that I have often turned to for his clear explanation of complex events. His book on the fall of France is the best discussion I know of the disaster at the Maginot Line, the best marshalling of geography, politics, and military strategy combined. I, I assign his book on Paris during the occupation in my seminar on World War II cinema. Uh, and, you know, I, I very much appreciated his award-winning biography of Charles de Gaulle. Now, in de Gaulle, he balances anecdote and concept, intellectual history and individual history, biography and metabiography. And he enables his reader to understand the polemical underpinnings of the previous accounts of key incidents in de Gaulle's storied career. In de Gaulle's story, Jackson has found an occasion to deploy his genius for clarification and to explode myths. For example, the story of the famous BBC speech of June 18, 1940, which it turns out is largely a post facto construction. Or his incredible analysis of de Gaulle's legendary phrase to the French in Algeria, I've understood you, which he interprets as de Gaulle just telling the crowd to quiet down, he's heard them. In both his de Gaulle biography and in France on trial, Julian Jackson savors the everyday life of his subject and knows how to provide the right punchline. And here's one of my favorite examples from de Gaulle. Um, Spears is serving de Gaulle on a, on a plane trip. They're about to refuel in Jersey and Spears remembers, I asked de Gaulle if he wanted anything and he said he'd like a cup of coffee. I handed it to him, whereupon taking a sip, he said in a voice that without implying criticism, he must nevertheless proclaim the truth that this was tea and he had asked for coffee. It was his first introduction to the tepid liquid, which in England passes for either one or the other. His martyrdom had begun. That's 
I think Julian Jackson's great sense of humor in a nutshell. Now, however unflinching his criticisms of, of de Gaulle, I had the sense throughout of deep admiration, awe even, and, and a tenderness for the private man, his ungainly body, the oddity of his diction that gave such a strange aura to his speeches. And that cannot be the case with Philippe Pétain. With Pétain, Julian Jackson leaves biography and enters another genre, the trial narrative. And it, as we know, French trials are organized like dramas with acts, the interrogation, the prosecution, the defense, with the courtroom as a stage set, uh, including an audience. But Pétain's trial is not an ordinary criminal proceeding with its enormous cast of characters, its double jury, men of the government and of the resistance. It's setting in the heat of summer in a small stuffy room, unbecoming such an event. And yes, the stakes are as overwhelming as assigning responsibility for a national trauma. Despite the absolute necessity of accounting for the armistice, the crimes of the, the milice, the decisions made by Pétain, everything that makes the judgment necessary. It couldn't have been obvious how to tell what happened hour by hour without drowning the reader in detail. When you write about a trial, you need to count the minutes and track the motivations and actions, speech actions of each character. It boggles the mind to think about the number of characters Julian Jackson needed to represent in his book. And yet I would say there is not a single boring character in France on trial. From the lions of the Third Republic, like Leon Brun, who brings the tragic note to the fore, to the pro-Nazis like Fernand de Brion, to Prime Minister Pierre Laval, uh, the evil sorcerer, the great sorcerer. Laval upstages Pétain in theatricality, and, and, and Julian calls that chapter the Pierre Laval show. He relishes, I think, in the description of Laval's astonishing ugliness. Jackson has an ally for these thumbnail sketches in some of the great correspondents of the day who cover the trial, Joseph Kessel and Janet Flanners, Madeleine Jacob, but also in Jacques Izerny, Pétain's defense lawyer, who set out to be Pétain's amanuensis and who ended up as the prisoner of Pétain's memory. Like a good filmmaker or theater director, Jackson has mapped out the space so that we can see people in the courtroom. He never misses an opportunity to describe a witness who's just finished testifying as he walks in front of Pétain's cane chair, nods or bows slightly. These moments of leave taking become important theatrical moments. Laval bends over Pétain and mutters in his thick Auvergnat accent, rolling the R's, au revoir, Monsieur le Maréchal. Pétain looks away, pretending not to see him. And then we get Isoni's response because Julian Jackson has read so deeply around the trial. Isoni wrote, as Laval bent forward, in the rapid movement, I detected compassion, a fugitive but genuine feeling of solidarity and mutual help, which seemed to me to deserve a better explanation. We enter the point of view this way. We enter the point of view of one character after another and following innumerable murmurings by Pétain and a few longish naps, we're treated to those moments when he can't really help himself and much to the chagrin of his defense rises to make a speech. And yet Pétain remains to some extent empty. My questions resolve around his presence and absence, both at his trial and his years as the head of Vichy France. So Julian, my first question is really about you. I'd like you to take us backstage with you as you went from working on de Gaulle and then Pétain. What was it like turning to Pétain's trial after publishing your de Gaulle biography? I mean, with de Gaulle, you had a lifetime of text, distinguished language. And I just note that de Gaulle's memoirs have been in the Bibliothèque de la Pléiade, uh, that same collection of classics that includes Molière and Voltaire and Proust. They've been in the Pléiade since 2000. With Pétain, and tell me if you agree, 
I, I couldn't help but wonder the whole time if anyone was home mentally. And when you look back at Pétain's language, there are the sentimental lines that have stuck, like, for if I could no longer be your sword, I've wanted to be your shield, or I the most famous, I give to France the gift of my person, which I believe was written by Emmanuel Baird. But these are slogans, they aren't thoughts. So I'm wondering what it was like to have to spend so much time with him. I think I can't help but say that it's easy for American readers to project onto Trump reading, reading your Pétain trial. I mean, Trump, a completely different personality, but we also wonder whether his lack of intelligence doesn't in fact make him more dangerous. My second question is related to the first one. Pétain appears to use his deafness as an excuse not to understand the charges leveled. And at the same time, when something significant is, is said, he rises from his stupor, even when he claims he didn't really hear what was said, but somehow he knows it was wrong. So I'd, I'd like you to come down on one side or another. And the answer you give in the book seems to me to be a mixture of both. And, and in, in that way, I'd like to just quote one passage where I feel these two forces in your evaluation of Pétain. Quote, the old man buffeted by contradictory advice, subjected to a rhythm of meetings that would have been punishing for a man half his age, fluctuated about the best course to follow but somewhere he clings amid the wreckage of his policies to his original gift of himself to the French. He had nothing else to cling to. The question that has always hovered over the Pétain trial in, in what I've read, I mean, for decades, is was he senile or not? Was he deaf or playing with deafness? Was he diminished by old age? Was he, as de Gaulle said, quote, a great figure, very intelligent, very stubborn, without character, died in 1924. Or, as many have argued, was he, you know, as the saying goes, crazy like a fox? Third question, um, Shannon has addressed the absence of the Jewish question in really interesting terms. And, and the absence in the trial seems to me in keeping with a more generalized post-war patriotism that blinded the courts to genocide. Same thing in the Braziac trial. Um, he was tried for, for treason for intelligence avec l'ennemi. The trial was remarkably devoid of references to deportation, even though Braziac took as his own Laval's toxic statement, we need to separate from the Jews and not keep the children. The historical understanding of the Holocaust was in its infancy. Um, but perhaps there was also a willingness to attribute deport, a desire to attribute deportation policy to Laval as head of the government, as the bad guy. My question is this, uh, would you say that there is a Pétain syndrome related to Rousseau's notion of a Vichy syndrome where the Jewish question within the Vichy regime evolves? And do the Vichy syndrome and the Pétain syndrome walk hand in hand? At one point, you say that people in surveys seem to take the same positions uh, in regard to Pétain over many years. But you also quote de Gaulle that in saying a historical drama is never over. Then you conclude, and unlike some of your reviewers, I don't disagree, that the extreme right in France no longer needs or even wants Pétain as their mascot a world in which Marine Le Pen's Rassemblement National marches to protest French anti-Semitism in the wake of the Hamas attacks. Is this a world in which Pétain's drama has finally played out? Thank you so much. Julian. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I, uh, uh, in the first, uh, the, the thing that's, really pleased me in what you said, Alice, was you kind of, in when you talked about narrative and the construction of narrative, you went to the heart of everything that I was trying to do and everything that tormented me for, for three years. Um, and 
I'll just say a word about that, because I mean, I do think that the writing of history, I, we, we mustn't be over pretentious, is an art, should be an art, should be a kind of art. We should aspire to that, even if, you know, we're not, we, we're, we're some of us novelists manquet. But, and I really thought about how to present this drama, because I felt it was a drama. Um, and my original way of going, doing it, there were, I think, 67 witnesses in the trial, maybe slightly more. And the way I did it in a first draft or an early draft was I had literally every witness there in the order in which they appear. So I, and I even had them swearing the oath saying, I am Paul Renault, I am this age, this is my profession, and this is where I live. I wanted the reader to be with the arrival of each witness, the swearing of the oath, the, the presentation of the witness. Um, I had to abandon that because one of my readers, and I decided the same thing, uh, my agent actually said I, I lost the will to live. And um, one of my readers said, uh, Jackson at this point introduced, says, and on this day, there was a um, a whole a parade of soporific generals, and he and he said soporific indeed. Did we have to? Did we have to listen to all they had to say? And they were right. These readers, uh, it was an idea I had because I wanted to really give the sense of the materiality, the presence. I actually wanted people to be in the courtroom, but it didn't work. It didn't work also because um, some people because there was a lot of repetition. So somebody would say something on Tuesday and on the following Friday, another witness who wasn't particularly important would say exactly the same thing. And it just became uh, too complicated for the reader. And so I decided uh, to break it to to basically break it down into chunks, as it were. So I had the first week with the prosecution witnesses, and then I had a particular chapter just on the Jews, the absent Jews, as I call it, where I could have summarized all the times the Jews come up. I, I extracted the Laval moment as a chapter of its own. And it was an, an, an attempt at artistry. And it was very, very difficult. And I and I sort of, I, I'm glad that, um, I, and I'd, I'd love to know how difficult it was for Alice. And I'm not saying my job was harder than hers. One way in which it was harder than hers is that I had three weeks and more witnesses, but then she had lots of other problems with her trial. No, so no, was, I had six hours. I had six <laughs> hours. Right, yes, but, it's not but, the same thing. It's a different. My hat is off to you, Julian. No, no, but there's all there's always there are always choices and there are always decisions about what one does include and what one doesn't include. And 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 I'm just glad you you raised that question because it was one of the things I was really exercised by. And I think I'm also glad that you raised another thing, which is I was very lucky in my commentators. My that's to say, you know, to have. Articles by Al, by Albert Camus, by François Mauriac, by Georges yeah. Bernanos, by Joseph Kessel, by Clavel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are you know grand plume. These are great writers. They have a they, they you know they they bring things alive, and so they become the sort of almost like the chorus, you know, the Greek chorus of my of my book and. And it's thanks to some of the vividness of the book it doesn't come from my prose, it comes from their prose. And, and even since since then, I've, um, I'm have i writing a, a book on about André Gide at the moment. It so happened, I was reading the diaries of Gide's greatest friend, uh, Robert Martin Dugard, a, a, a not very well-known novelist today, but a Nobel Prize winner and very important in the 30s. And to my astonishment, I came and I had no idea that he'd been present at the trial. So in the French Edition, I've been able to include Martin Dugard's very vivid account of the trial. And I might come back to that because it, it relates to the issue of the absent Pétain. So, yes, that was really important to me. And um, to the extent I and I'm glad that you that you picked up on it and thought that it was succeeded, because to me, that was the thing I most sort of wanted to do. The emptiness of Pétain. Um, I mean, I think that's a. There is this. Kind of, there is a sort of drama of this. There is this old man sitting silent. Occasionally he gets out, he occasionally he does uh, intervene, usually rather inappropriately. And a lot of the time, the journalists 
the commentators are looking what's going on in his head they watch how he's 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 rubbing the the arms of his of his armchair he's he's stroking his kepi which is on the table what's going on in this old man's head now i don't think Pet petin was 89 and i don't think you know he was a man of 89 and there'd been a slow slowing of his mental faculties and so on but i think the emptiness of the old man is a kind of emptiness which is already there, which is what um, I think what, what Alice was suggesting. It seems to me that Pétain, one of the sort of tragedies of Pétain, I find Pétain, you're right, I find de Gaulle, in, I wouldn't want to sit next to de Gaulle at dinner, but he seems to me to be an extraordinary, fascinating mind in action, not just an actor, but a mind. Pétain seems to me to be a sort of empty vessel whose tragedy is that he became the prisoner of his own myth. He was the war hero of 1916 and 1917, and he became, he emerged from the First World War as the hero of heroes. I don't think in two centuries of French history there's been anybody who quite had that aura. Uh, he had the aura of, of, of Foch and Hindenburg and Haig, he was both the soldier's friend and the victor of Verdun. And it went to his head. And he started to believe that he was not just a great soldier, but a sage and a prophet. And in the interwar years, he starts to develop ideas about education and the family and reforming French institutions and so on. But the ideas are so uninteresting. And that's the problem with any biography of Pétain. There isn't really a very interesting mind. There's, there's a banality there, an ordinary ordinariness. He's the vessel of for other people. So I think what people saw, and, and, and Isoni, who in a kind of way, and I, I'd be interested to know what Alice thinks about this, because Isoni was the, the, the Isoni, the defense lawyer of Peta, was also the defense lawyer of her protagonist, Braziak. And Isoni was a young, clever, charismatic lawyer on the make. And he saw an opportunity in Brasiak, and he saw an opportunity in Peta. And the relationship he developed with Peta was very complicated because he arrived the first day he went to see Peta, the other lawyer, the senior lawyer, who Peta, uh, the senior lawyer, who was basically planning to to use the defence of Peta, the, the senile Peta, the Peta led astray. The moment. The first meeting Isoni had alone with Peta, he basically said, you have got to be Peta, as he were. You've got to be the hero you are. And he actually said to Peta, the words that Peta said to the French people, I make the gift of my person. He said, I make the gift of my person, Isoni, to you, Peta. I will be your servitor. And it was manipulative, but it was also deeply believed, I think. I mean, Isoni started really to take on emotionally the Pétain case. And it was very frustrating for him because he'd have these things he had to defend. He thought, well, what on earth is the defence? So he says to Pétain, well, what did you mean by saying? What did you mean by saying in your speech that French workers who go and work in German factories in the war, what do you mean by saying that they're working for France? French workers working in German factories, what do you mean? And, and Pétain said, I haven't I really don't know. I can't remember saying that. I don't know what I meant. You'll have to tire bouchonner. You'll have to really rack your brains to find an answer. And so Isoni basically says himself in his defense, uh, in his book later, he said, I invented the pétain I needed. And in some ways, he has to fascinatingly sort of reconstruct the history that pétain isn't giving him because pétain hasn't really, pétain is too absent to be able, as it were, to provide, he has, his memory isn't what it was. But the relationship between these two men is, I think, one of the sort of fascinating emotional dramas of the trial. And the, the um, ferocious journalist, Madeleine Jacob, who was, uh, uh, she wrote brilliant articles. She was uh, very much associated with the Communist Party at this time. Her position was, you know, Peter should be should be shot. I mean, Peter was a traitor. She was implacable, famously implacable. But nonetheless, when Isioni came up to do his plaidoirie, to do his defense of Peter, she offered him a glass of water, said, good luck. And she wrote an article saying, the thing that will remain in our minds from the trial of Marshal Peta is the speech of Maître Isorni. This, so in a way, Isorni is the is the is a sort of hero, heroic anti-hero of the story, and 
And in a sort of way, partly his job is made easier by the non-existence of Peter, that he can make the Peter he needs. But I, I totally uh, agree with you about, about, about that emptiness, really. De Gaulle had a... a, a, a and let's let's on the on the, the Jewish issue, the next question you raised, which um I, I think I, I'll actually slightly reverse what I said earlier, because a lot of people have written about the trial who's not who you know who's written about it in passing, have said anti-Semitism was not discussed at all. That's actually not true. It comes up quite a bit here and there, but it's never central. It's always off, it's always in the sidelines, it's always in the coulisses. And one of the reasons is for that is what I said, that it doesn't really fit into Article 75. Another reason is, as Alice said, that in 1945, the specificity of the Holocaust was simply not present in France or indeed in Europe. So when the deportés, deportees, came back to France in 1945 from camps, some some lucky Jewish survivors, very few Jews came back because most had been killed, but some did come back. But the word deporté made no distinction between resistors who'd been sent to camps and Jews who'd been sent to camps. So there was no, no sense of the specificity of the Jewish tragedy. And what is also very interesting is that even somebody like Madeleine Jacob, of course, who was herself Jewish, and um, was how little she is interested in what seems to me uh, uh, what could have been a key moment really in the trial and i'll i'll just uh, if i may just 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 mention this gripping moment actually when one of the defense witnesses called defense witnesses called to talk about the jewish issue is the man who had presided the commission for the denaturalization of jews the, one of the first things that Vichy did was set up this committee to look at the cases of Jews who had been foreigners who had been naturalized in the 1920s by a law that the conservatives considered to be too liberal. They think these people shouldn't be French. They should be denaturalized. So it sets up this commission. The man who is the president of the commission is a man called Houssel. He's a he's a conseiller d'etat. He's a sort of a, a civil servant. And he's brought to defend what he did, saying, well, we if we hadn't been there, the commission trying to look at each case carefully, the Germans would have just denaturalized everybody and it would have been much worse. So he's brought in as defense witness. The reason Mornay, the prosecutor, sorry, the reason that Izoni, the defense attorney, brings him in is because he knew that the prosecutor in the trial, right, the man who is prosecuting Petain, Mornay, had been on that same commission. Under So here you have one man who's brought out of prison to testify in Petain's defense, with the prosecutor who had sat, who is a hero at this time, who had sat in the same commission to denaturalize the Jews. But what is interesting is nobody, even somebody like Madeleine Jacob, thought, well, isn't this where we can get Vichy? Because after all, this denaturalization commission, or the first Jewish statute, which excludes French Jews from all kinds of position, professional positions and so on, was an entirely Vichy-generated law, which nobody was particularly interested in the trial. Uh, it, but and, it, and yet it was an entirely, as it were, domestic and French issue. So I just, I suppose, further shows how little, really, people are interested in the Jewish issue. Finally, the, the, the Petain syndrome. I like that. I, I like that uh, idea of the Petain syndrome. Y yes, I, 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 I see exactly what you mean. And I'll, and I'll just say I don't really understand it because there's one thing that really surprised me that nobody until you actually just now picked up on uh, a passage late in the book where I look at opinion polls. I look at every opinion poll. I don't know about everyone, but a lot of opinion polls where people since 1945 have been asked, what do you think of Marshal Petain, etc.? And the questions are usually, do you think Petain was a traitor? Do you think Petain did his best? Do you think the armistice should have been signed or not, etc.? What's essentially astonishing is that the answers to those questions, when they first started to be asked in the 1970s and right up to the end of the 1990s, have hardly changed. Um, tiny percent think he was a traitor, a tiny percent think he was a hero. Most people, have, it's always around 50 to 60 percent saying he was a man who did his best in difficult circumstances and the armistice was probably a better thing than not. And yet we know that 80 percent of people um, 
support Jacques Chirac's speech, which skewers the complicity of Vichy in the deportation of Jews. So it's like this almost a schizophrenia in French minds. At one level, or oh, Pétain's not so bad, really, at another level, but we know that the Vichy regime uh, was complicit in the Holocaust, and we all accept it was. So there is something complex still, in my opinion, in the relationship that the French have in their imaginaire, if you want, with Pétain. And perhaps it's it's nicely summed up by a little anecdote uh, relating to de Gaulle. When Pétain died in 1951, uh, de Gaulle's, uh, Georges Pompidou, who was later de Gaulle's prime minister, but at that time was a close advisor to de Gaulle, Pompidou came in, a much younger man than de Gaulle, and said, um, General, I just want to tell you, uh, Pétain has died. And Pétain and, and de Gaulle looked at him, there's a silence, and he said, oui, le maréchal est mort, the marshal is dead. So he corrects Pompidou, who'd said Pétain, and he said, no, it's not for you to say Pétain, Pétain is the marshal. So there's something about the marshal, about Pétain, about the myth, about Verdun, which clouds, which, which is a kind of parallel or intertwining Pétain syndrome. And of course, as I talk more in answer to that question, it more and more sounds as though the Pétain case isn't closed, doesn't it? Um, and I'm talking myself out of my last sentence. But I think your point there is is an interesting one and and worth sort of unpicking unpicking more. I, I, yeah, I, I don't think you can parse it so easily. Just the fact you have to divide people what people think when they hear the word Vichy, and then when they hear about the Maréchal Pétain as the war hero, somehow they cling to the war hero a little bit. And, uh, yes, and, and you know, um, one of the in in, in uh, two thousand eighteen for the for the centenary of the armistice, Macron tried to um, flowers, uh, right? Uh, uh, well, there, there's there's been a whole issue with presidents right through to Mitterrand about whether or not flowers were put on Pétain's tomb. From Mitterrand onwards, no one has done it. From 1991 onwards, no one has put flowers on his tomb. But nonetheless, Macron in 2018 said something like, is it not possible that we can, uh, on the centenary of the end of the First World War, um, remember um, and honour all the eight marshals of France, Petter obviously being one of the eight. And there was an, a huge outcry and two days later. It was a kind of ty typical piece of Macron triangulation in a sense, and he had to backtrack very quickly and, and that it, was, it was quickly forgotten. So there is this, he is this strange presence that still hovers over France. I mean, I, I end my book, so I, I, I want to let other people ask questions but i end my book with my own visit to the to the petain's tomb which was quite fun and i i spent a week lurking around the cemetery in which he is in which he's buried to see what was happening and uh again it was interesting to see the the cult the diminished cult of followers but they are still there anyway i'll i'll, I'll leave any further answers um and i i can see some questions in the chat but perhaps people want to put their hands up and i can try and answer some questions and so on Thank you. And we have some hands up. And the first one in the queue is Stephen Shore. If you would unmute, you may pose your question. Did uh, de Gaulle, can you hear me, first of all? Yes, I can, I can. Yep. Did de Gaulle personally commute the death sentence? And did was the, the real consequence of doing so to seal Laval's fate? Um, well, I also very quick. Yes, he he did he did commute it. He always he was always going to commute it. And actually, uh, the jurors themselves, after voting by one a very narrow majority of one vote for the death penalty, and they were, were all he was going to be found guilty. But was he going to be? Were they going to actually vote for the death penalty? By one vote, they did. But they then had a second vote in which by a bigger majority, they agreed that they to recommend that the death penalty not be carried out, which would have been de Gaulle's, um, de Gaulle's uh, position anyway. And the reason is it would have seemed, it would have been unbelievably divisive, seemed to 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 shoot a, a, a 90 year old man uh, who's, who had the, you know this aura around him. So it, it, the reason that it was commuted was the, um, in the, the, the um, 
uh, not just the awfulness of shooting a 90 year old man who had been a hero, but the divisiveness it would have caused. Um, and so I don't think they're connected to Laval, the, the Laval's trial, which took place a few months later, was a grotesque parody of a trial. It was a, a, a horrible event. Everybody <laughs> agreed it was a horrible event. It was a travesty of a trial. And uh, he was shot. Um, but that but actually that trial caused a, a, a lot of soul searching about the whole way that the, the high court was operating. So I don't think in De Gaulle's mind, though, I don't think that Laval is the sacrificial victim. He was, Laval would have been shot anyway. Um, and I don't think there's a, a connection between the two. But for De Gaulle, it would have been impossible to shoot Pétain. And, and uh, just because uh, I, I include in the book a lot of the correspondence that people uh, write. With, there was a um, one of the uh, prosecution witnesses who was quite a distinguished conservative politician from the interwar years, received a massive post bag of abusive letters from former supporters of his saying, how can you, how can you testify against the marshal? Um, you, you're, you're, you're in hock to the Jews, you're in hock to the Freemasons and so on. There was uh, an enormous amount of, uh, um, not just residual sympathy, but, but, but sort of be be belief in Petta. And, and if I can just this really would just take a minute. Somebody, the first question that appeared in the chat, somebody said, well, you didn't really talk, um, somebody, Deirdre Con Con Conley, she says, you're assuming we know the exact stances of the two sides. I expected to hear more of the arguments in support and against Petter. Well, the arguments, there were arguments in support, and I tried to take them seriously. There's the double game that uh, that he was he, he negotiated some kind of secret deal with Churchill. Nonsense, but but it was enough plausibility for that to go on circulating right to the 1980s. The so-called secret messages, telegrams that Pétain secretly sent to Admiral Dalon in 1942 to say, I do I support your rallying to the Americans. No one had ever seen the secret telegrams, but they were an important part of the Pétain case for many years. The idea, Pétain the old fox, duplicitously, with duplicity, um uh he he uh, uh you know, deceiving Hitler under the on the uh, uh, and shaking his hand at Montois, but really doing a deal with Churchill behind his back. The idea of Pétain, the man who sacrificed his glory to save the French, that he did all these things. Not be, he, he could have he he sacrifices the, the the prestige he's had to be the shield. So those were the arguments that circulated for the next 30, 40 years. And they're very, very present in 1945. It's very raw in 1945. So shooting him would have been um impossible. And only really the communists were for shooting. Most of the resistance thought the same thing, just, just better forget about him. Put him in the island. Unfortunately, he lived longer than expected, and he wasn't completely forgotten about thanks to Jackie Zorni. But that was the idea of the government. He'll quietly, they put him in an island which is completely inaccessible. There was only one ferry a day, and poor old Izoni, who used to go and see him when he was in prison, who suffered badly from seasickness, always arrived green and vomiting uh, after the crossing. Uh, but he said, you know, it shows my it shows my devotion to the marshal that nonetheless I will put up with this. So they hoped he'd be forgotten, but he wasn't forgotten. Thank you. Suzanne Roberts, your hand is up. Please unmute. Pose your question. You will need to unmute. So that doesn't seem to be working. So we're going to move on to Helen Sonnenschein. If you would unmute. Going once. Alas, two in a row. Well, what about Spencer Michaels? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So you mentioned public opinion after the war, but what about a public opinion toward Pétain and the Vichy regime during the war, starting in May of 1940? What, what was the trend in both the North and the South of France? 
Okay, I'll answer that very quickly because it's not it, it's been written about by others. And I, I in my answer, I, I won't be saying anything specific to my research, but what I know from particularly uh, a book that stands up still today by a man called Pierre Labori, who's now died, but I still I think the best book uh, really about general public opinion under Vichy. But it's been worked uh, by Shannon herself has contributed impo- contributed importantly to this subject. But in in a, in a word, basically, uh, he is the hero of heroes, nineteen forty. Uh, that tiny proportion of people are opposed to Petain in 1940. They think he's the savior. There is, uh, over the course of the occupation, particularly after he shakes Hitler's hand at Montois, uh, doubts start to be expressed. Resistors at the beginning have been and thought Petain was doing his best, and then they realize um, that they may start to turn against Petain and so on. And so there is a, 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 a change in public opinion, but nonetheless, people make a distinction between Pétain, Pétain and the regime. So Laval is the evil genius, Pétain, even up to 1942, retains a certain amount of popularity. It slumps in 1943, but the astonishing thing is there's actually a resurgence in Pétain's popularity in 1944, when you might have thought it had been on a, on a continuous downward curve. And the reason for that is when the Allied bombing of France starts in, on, in, in earnest in 1944, Pétain starts to visit cities that have been in rubble, that have been bombed with people who've lost their houses, you know, lost their homes uh, and and um, many casualties. And he even and he goes on that tour. He goes, in fact, to Paris. The only time he goes in the whole of the occupation in April 1944. And he's treated as a kind of um, uh, there's a resurgence of the idea of Pétain as the protector. Pétain, who's doing his best to show his his sympathy and his solidarity with us. So curiously, by the end of the war, there'd even been a slight upturn in Pétain's popularity. And one question one could ask is why did uh, Pétain come back to France? Why didn't he just stay in Switzerland uh, as he could have done uh, when he escaped from he, he went from Germany to Switzerland. The Swiss wouldn't have been very keen to have him, but they would have, I think, given him asylum. But he says, absolutely, no, I want to go back to France. And I think one reason he wants to go back to France is that he 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 was unaware of, uh, because of these occasions I've described, he had lived in a sort of bubble of adulation. And I think he actually sort of half believed that he was a hero to the majority of the French population still in 1945. The big change really comes in May 1945, when the first deportees come are released from the concentration camps in April, May 1945. And these people who arrive, skeletons in their pajamas, are more dead than alive, causes an extraordinary shock to public opinion. It's just at the moment that Pétain also comes back to France. So old Pétain comes back, and then suddenly with the returning deportees, the survivors of concentration camps, uh, the, the, the simultaneity of those two things is a real shock to public opinion and leads to a kind of um, uh, a slump in Pétain's popularity in the spring of 1945. But the story of Pétain and the French is a complicated one, but that's a, a short answer to your question. Thank you. We have time, I believe, for one more. Katrin Schulteis, unmute. Join in. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, can Can you just talk? It's, a, I guess, a big topic, but you have two minutes to answer it. But um, <laughs> Uh, what is the role of shame in this whole event? Um, because it was, you know, the occupation of France and the quick defeat of France was a shameful moment. You know, Pétain's associated with being the hero of Verdun. And so what is the role that shame plays in the events that you see playing out during the trial? I think shame is always there. Uh, so it's an interesting question. I don't actually... I don't think my book actually has the word shame in it, but uh, I, I think I use I think synonyms for shame, and and I think it it does sometimes appear. It's very clear uh, in the first after the the first day of the trial, the court ends in complete uproar uh, because uh, they're, they're literally they're sort of people clambering on desks and shouting and it, that never happens again. And many of the press write, we've already lived through the shame of occupation. Are we now going to, are we now going to humiliate ourselves in front of the world? Uh, 
by not being able to conduct with dignity. Dignity is a word that's often used. Honor is a word that's often used. This really important event. And I think that that's it's a it's a kind of separating saw throughout. And there's and it comes up again and again. Um, the it comes up, I think, in a sort of way, most movingly in although the, the word shame perhaps isn't the one that he uses, but it's it's underneath his whole testimony. One of the most moving moments of the trial, universal by universal consent, was the moment when the socialist leader, former socialist leader, Leon Bloom, who had been in a camp in a on, in a rest opposite near to Buchenwald, he wasn't actually in Buchenwald, but he wasn't very far away. Um, could come back only a few weeks before the trial testifies as one of the prosecution witnesses and it's one of the the most intense moments really because most of the other witnesses for the prosecution who had been third republic politicians when it when they're asked by the defense will you say that peta is a traitor they can't quite bring themselves to say it. That perhaps relates to some of the other questions asked. They can't use, the, they say, we think he he betrayed his, um, the, the honor of France or his duties as a Frenchman. But no, I never said he was a traitor. So they find it hard to say that word, partly because they all know they're sort of semi-complicit in what happened in 1940. But Bloom will have none of that. And there's this extraordinary scene where he, and remember that in the trial, the witnesses, are standing about three feet away from Petta, usually with their back to him, talking to the judges. And the judge says to Pet to Bloom, you're talking very quietly. We can hardly hear you. Can you turn around and address the court? So he turns around, which means he's facing Petta. And then he moves and he's literally standing and the eyes of the two men lock. And Petta never says a word, but he holds up his hands in a kind of supplication to say I'm not what you think and Pet and Bloom talks there about uh yes we can call him a traitor but throughout his testimony there's a sense of the shame of what he lived through in 1940 as people who he had believed to be colleagues and friends and comrades all rally to Petta in the vote that gave Petta full powers at, Vich at, at in the in the National Assembly in 1940. So, sorry, that's not a very uh, because I I don't much use the word. It's not a very clear answer to your question, but I think it's a very uh, very important question, and I might I will think about it more. But yes, I think that sense, the shame of what's happened to France, that the saw is 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 always there. And when people like Clavel talk about this, it, it, this, this, this is a metaphysical as well as a judicial trial, they're talking about deep humiliation and deep shame. So, yeah, I, I almost we can't sort of look at it totally because it in the face because it's so it's it we feel so humiliated by what France has been through. So, yeah, it's not a very coherent answer, but I think it's a very good question. Well, thank you. I have the unfortunate task of drawing this to a close. It clearly could go on for much, much longer, but I want to thank Julian, Shannon, and Alice for this conversation and thank those in the audience uh, and apologies to those whose questions we couldn't get to. Please remember, you can join us next when we reconvene uh, on November 20th at 4 p.m. next Monday for a session on Catherine Kramer Brownell's new book, 24-7 Politics, Cable News and the Fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News, an AHA session with commentators Margaret O'Mara and Nicole Hammer. So till next week, take care, everyone. Good night and thank you.